I'm Miwa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Port Over. And Kazaya Weir is one of my favorite humans on the planet. So if we sound a little looser today, yeah, we are. But also, I'm going to ask you, my friend, to do the elevator pitch for the myth makers. And then I'll explain why I'm asking you to do that. But yeah, would you do that for us? Yes, yes. So um, the myth makers centers on a woman named Sal, who is a young magazine journalist living in New York City. She is sort of at loose ends at work, dealing with some some strange work stuff, and uh, picks up a literary magazine, reads a short story, realizes that the short story feels very much like it's about her life. It's by an older author who she had met at a party years earlier, and she goes off in search of answers. The author has died, so she tracks down his widow who lives in upstate New York, and all kinds of shenanigans ensue. Okay, and I'm going to add, she is one of the more unreliable narrators I've met (laughs) recently. But one of the things, too, and you and I have talked about this on and off for a while leading up to the publication of this book, but it's kind of an old-fashioned novel, right? Like, there's no time travel, there's no dystopian, like, it is kind of a super, like, people have terrible secrets and people do bad things and people love literature and they bump into weird situations and they put themselves into weird situations, but... And that's not to say that those other books don't have, like, I mean, I think people know I read really widely. Yeah, yeah. This was kind of exactly the novel I expected from you. (laughs) (laughs) I mean. Yeah. We got to talk about this for a second because you have been working on this for a while. Yes. You also have kind of a fancy day job. I do. I uh, So I started writing the book in 2014. I had been working at Elle magazine as an editorial assistant for about a year by the time when I started writing this book. And I was at Elle for around five years. And then now I am uh, an editor at Vanity Fair. So that's the day job. And you're doing some celebrity stuff and some fashion stuff and a lot of book stuff. Yeah. But I bring that up because Sal has decided that she's going to write about her adventure. Yes. Chasing down this story. And I kind of also want to be clear, though, that this is not autofiction. Like, can we just be straight up? Like, this is not autofiction. This is, I have some cool stuff that I want to talk around. And I think it's important to raise that, too, because a lot of the stuff that you bring up in The Myth Makers, which some of which we are super not talking about. <laughs> this is airing no, right around the time you pub, so we are not, there's stuff we are not talking about. <laughs> you know, the way people assume that they somehow own someone else's story? Yeah, yeah. I think, so when I started writing the book, I, you know, I had graduated from college where I had studied literature the year before, and um, I had been reading a lot of Nabokov and Philip Roth. So I was already really interested in ideas of storytelling and how to tell a story and who gets to tell a story. Um, But then when I started working at the magazine and uh, started sort of seeing the behind the scenes of how profiles are put together and magazine profiles, you know, that's just one of my absolute favorite things to read and now to write. I think, you know, you do start thinking about the questions that arise when you are holding somebody else's story and when you're the person who's in charge of of putting that story out into the world. You're also thinking about the fact that the person who you're writing about can be withholding or can, you know, shape their story to various degrees. I think all of those questions came up when I was writing. And it's fun to read. Good. And, you know, I was thinking too, Emma Klein's new novel has just come out, The Guest. Yes, which I love. And yeah, okay. So Alex, you've read The Guest too. Yes. And our new, <laughs> Alex, the protagonist of The Guest. I'm not saying she and Sal are totally similar but there are echoes of each in the other and i think alex would probably not notice sal and sal would be very judgy about alex <laughs> that's sort of that's a very fair assessment <laughs> um yeah uh alex i think as a as a main character was so interesting to read because she has so little backs backstory so much yeah, of yeah. who she is is just right on the page mm-hmm. 
I think that there is a little bit of that with Sal as well. Uh, mm-hmm. There is sort of this reluctance for her to share certain aspects of her biography. There's yeah. you, you don't um, you find out a lot about what she would like you to find out about. I love an unreliable narrator because I like to puzzle through and I like to occasionally be a little judgy about my fictional characters. <laughs> but Sal, you know, she's young, she's messy, she's not necessarily making great decisions. She really likes a cocktail. Really she does. Really she cocktail. very much likes the cocktail. <laughs> she doesn't so much like her, it turns out. Yeah, and maybe she needs to take a step back from that, but she really, she's self-absorbed in the way that young people who are really ambitious can be self-absorbed. Like, it doesn't occur to her that she isn't actually the main character. <laughs> in the in this story of the in world. In this particular yes. story, yes. Yeah. And yeah. watching her work her way through and the way you've structured the Myth Makers, right? Like, we're going to leave some characters out, but we're going to focus on... Sal and the writer himself, Martin, and his wife, Moira. Yes. They also have a daughter, Caroline, who may or may not pop up later as we go. But we're going to leave out some other folks so that people can really enjoy the ride as much as I did. But I think the three, the three of them are sort of the soul of the myth makers. Yeah. And Sal, you know, she, when she first meets Martin, she's very young. Uh, She has just left school and she's attending a literary party um, that's held at the New York Public Library. So she's sort of in an impressionable spot already. And then she meets this man who's in his seventies. She has no idea who he is while she's talking to him, except as she talks to him, she realizes that he's a writer. One of his former students comes over at one point and says, you know, like, I was rereading your first novel and I loved it so much. Uh, So Sal sort of gets the impression that he's, you know, an important-ish writer. And he starts saying all kinds of lovely things to her about how she is a writer and how, you know, she uh, just needs to sort of, you know, go out and, and take this for herself. And so that makes an impression on her. And so then when she comes across the story uh, six years later, having not maybe reached the professional heights that she hoped that she would have by that point, it sparks something in her. And so uh, she's devastated when she finds out that he has died. And this all happens quite early in the book. So I don't think that this is too much of a spoiler for anybody. But she realizes that his widow is is alive and well and living in upstate New York. And she for various reasons, is sort of ready to airlift herself out of her life. And so she gets on a bus and goes to see this woman who sort of reluctantly allows her in. Moira is also a scientist. Yes. Moira is a physicist. (laughs) (laughs) Nice choice. (laughs) Yes. All kinds of, uh, there is so much um, reading and talking to people who uh, <laughs> know what they're talking about when it comes to physics that I sort of had to try to wrap my brain around to even just get a small amount into the book. Part of what I appreciate, though, about the Mythmakers is the way marriage is handled, right? Like, Moira is not here to preserve Martin's legacy. He was her husband. He is the father of her daughter. He was... The love of her life, I suppose we could say. Like, really, yeah, I mean, I think like, that there's yes, there's a really deep love between the two of them. You know, they meant the world to each other. You know, I had been reading all of these. Um, you know, Nabokov really sort of was my north star when I was writing this book, and I adore his writing. I think you know his his relationship with his wife uh, Vera was very specific and. Uh-huh. <laughs> You know, Vera d- did everything for him and uh, drove him places and held his wallet and transcribed his writing. You know, she was uh, like secretary, first reader, editor, everything. And uh, Moira is very much not that to Martin. And Martin is very much not a Nabokov. So <laughs> that was sort of an interesting dynamic to be exploring. Martin shows us who he is in the book. And I sort of have to let that hang in the air. It's not, 
He just shows us who he is. And I laughed every single time something popped. Where I was like, yeah, of course. Of course, that's who this dude is. Did Martin and Moira and Sal sort of show up together? Did you start with the idea of the book or did you start with the voice? Because they're all very distinct. Yeah, I think I think Moira really came first. I'm not really sure where she came from. She but but that character was sort of floating around in my head for a while. And then I had an experience that was very similar to the one that Sal had at the New York Public Library <laughs> when I was very young. And I, I, you know, ran into this older screenwriter who, right. you know, was in his 70s at the time. And he said all kinds of lovely things to me as well. And, and you know, I never had anything to do with him ever again. But uh, I think that experience sort of crystallized an idea that maybe I had been kicking around for a while um, of this younger woman writer who sort of, you know, goes off in search of her idol. At different times, I thought Martin maybe would be more or less successful. He's sort of just, a, you know, he's he's an author who was able to publish a number of books, but he, you know, didn't win prizes. He didn't, you know, if you were walking down the street, he's not somebody who who anyone would just, he's not a household name. And I think we I was- all that mid-list. Right. He has a very midless career and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just harder to do. Yeah. I think it's kind of important to point out that you had to go back in time. Yes. Right. To establish that because the the book world has changed a little bit and it is much harder to live the sort of bookish career that Martin had, where he's not sitting on top of the bestseller lists and he's not publishing a book a year kind of thing. Like he's just okay. This is what he does, but he's relatively obscure, except you have this great line. This made me howl. This made me totally howl. It was something like Martin always looked for applause, but the applause of one person was simply not enough for him. And I'm paraphrasing you poorly, but I was howling when I read that line (laughs) because I was just like, yeah, basically he's kind of doing this in a vacuum, Yeah, but he would like to have a much bigger presence in the world. Yeah, he's, I think, you know, he wants to be famous for his, for his writing um, and, you know, sort of doesn't ever get to the place that he wants to. And I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of people have have that in their careers. There's always somebody who's doing a little bit better than you. Martin does remind me, Martin, the sort of exchange between Martin and Moira and Sal kind of reminds me a little bit of Commonwealth. The Ann Patchett novel. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Like who who has the right to tell a story and who does the story belong to? And the opening of that. Oh, man, the opening of Come is still one of the best, best openings of a book. Yeah. But you're playing with this throughout. Like, you know, we're we're sitting in the present day, obviously. And you do. There are some there's a little bit of backstory that you give to Martin and more, but it's like the seventies, right? It's like the early seventies sort of figuring yeah, stuff well, out. Yeah. But it feels very much like it could have been, I mean, to me, like it could have been the fifties or it could have been the sixties. Like, you know, there are still cocktail parties and people still dress up. It's just this idea of nostalgia, right? Like Martin totally buys into nostalgia. Moira's was a little like, I'm going to make my own life, whatever. And Sal is just like, she might be more nostalgic than anyone and she's never even lived through this stuff, right? Like she's significantly younger than everyone. And I think that's such a specific feeling, you know, the nostalgia for a time that you didn't live in, especially if you're in books and print media, (laughs) the idea, you know, the the, uh, (laughs) uh, looking back at other eras as the golden age that you missed. But then of course there's all kinds of, you know, complications that come along with that. And I think, you know, Martin is sort of trying to scramble his way into this certain um, mm-hmm. group of group of people who he sort of ends up on the outskirts of. And right. then and Sal, in a certain way, is is having that happen as well um, in, in her own career. And so I think that in her interest in Martin a lot of that is interest in herself. (laughs) You know, there've been lots of conversations in the last few years about likability 
of characters and how much some people need. Some readers want likable. I'm not one of those people. But the thing about the likability conversation that is so interesting to me is it's mostly talking about female characters. Almost it's like, well, the women have to be likable. And I'm like, why? It's interesting. I, my editor, when I, when we were working on this book was saying that, you know, so much of the question of likability is less about like their actual characteristics and more about whether or not the reader can understand what they want. Yeah, but then yeah. when, when you do start bringing up the ideas of women and likability, I think then that becomes complicated because I, I do think the idea of women wanting anything or striving for anything people read that in in negative ways in a way that men and male characters you know maybe maybe are just allowed to want things in in a different way yeah like if i think of um elif patuman's novels right the idiot and either or like there are people who've had very visceral reactions to celine her narrator who is like you know when we first meet her she's an 18 year old kid by the end of either or she's all of wait for it, 20 years old. I mean, come on. And, you know, I see all of these bits written in different places. And I'm like, you know, she's basically a kid, right? Like, think back to when you were 18, 19, 20. And as much as I'm kind of making fun of Sal, because she really, there are a couple of moments where she does some very dumb stuff, or she'll say something. And I'm like, oh, sweetie, this is not about you, but okay. But Sal's at what, at most like 25, 26? Like she's really young. 26, 27, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, she's really young and doesn't really have a point of comparison for anything certainly doesn't know what might constitute a healthy relationship like her parents are kind of bananas and her relationship <laughs> with her boyfriend he was not good wow no it is not not, good. not, a relationship. <laughs> not good um, yeah yeah and and i think there is you know just at different parts of your life you become or one can become more or less solipsistic. And right. uh, she's in a particularly solipsistic phase where, you know, she's gone through this issue with her job. She, you know, no longer has that job. She sort of like lost a big part of her identity. And I think when the chips are down often, you know, everything, everything suddenly becomes about you. And um, so she's, she's in that for sure. She wants so much and I'm certainly not, saying she shouldn't have something but there are a couple of lines neither of which I can throw out here because if I do I'm giving too much away where it's in response to information that she is not given right yes. and and Moira turns around and says well you didn't you never asked <laughs> and yeah. it's kind of big I mean it's, <laughs> and and Moira's not wrong she's not wrong at all but here's Sal you know she's a little bit of a bulldog yeah but she does like when she's not bulldogging it, she's also being really passive and just expecting people to open up and share these sort of big secrets, I guess is the best word to use. And it's yeah. funny watching this kid work her way through. <laughs> like, how do you even get words on the page? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's also that thing of, you know, how easy it is to have blind spots or to if you think that you know what the story is. Um, how much you close off. I think that happens for Sal in big and small ways. Um, And and that is something, you know, that, that I think I have continued to learn in interviewing people, just that if you go in thinking that you know exactly how a conversation is going to go, probably it will go that way. But you might be missing out on you know, huge, huge sections of information that if you uh, are a little bit more willing to sort of follow cues of the other person, then uh, you might go somewhere more interesting or or surprising. And I feel that way, you know, in friendships and uh, relationships and just talking to, you know, talking to people that if you actually listen to people, which can be hard, like it sometimes is hard to not be thinking of how you're going to respond. I totally am guilty of that. Um, but if you listen and then ask questions, often people do want to tell you more. And that I think is always where the most interesting things come up. Yeah. You know, I want to go back to the guest for two seconds because you, something you just said made me think of Alex, where Alex is really good at reading the room 
But then she makes terrible decisions because (laughs) she's young. She doesn't know what to do with the information. She doesn't quite know how to process it. And then Sal also, like, I wonder who she's going to become as an adult. And I realize, you know, technically 26, 27, like you're paying your own rent, everything. You are closer to the new 20. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, you're closer to adulthood than you were. But does Sal grow up to be the narrator of that novel, Vladimir? (laughs) <laughs> right like the Julia yeah. May Jonas you know what I'm talking about this English professor who's just like she's so we've met men like this woman before in literature but we've never met her and she's so kind of like she's not evil she's just really deluded <laughs> yeah well and I think it, but like what's interesting about all those characters mm-hmm. um, you know Alex in the guest has sort of made, you know, her life's work is sort of a study of the men around her and men in power. I think that Sal has done that in a certain way with her literary tastes. And I think in Vladimir, that's also, you know, it's in keeping, you know, one of the things that was happening when I was writing the book is that I had been studying all of these really brilliant male authors uh, and and you know was just in love with that writing um and then when i started working at l which is you know obviously a women's magazine and all of my bosses were women and i was reading a lot of contemporary fiction by women authors i was reading you know like finding zadie smith's essays for the first time and I was reading a lot of Nicole Krauss and uh, I think R.O. Kwan's The Incendiaries came out well, you know, a few years in into that job. And and I think, you know, I my understanding of what literature could do or could be and who could be writing it was definitely shifting um, in the early early years of writing this book. Yeah. So it goes back to who becomes canon. You're right. Like right. who does the anointing, right? Like. Yeah. If you think about, so, I mean, when I was younger, I used to be able to recite the last paragraph of Wapshaw Chronicle, <laughs> the John Cheever novel. And it's great. I mean, it's letter, it's Leander's letter to his sons. And that's yeah. all I'm going to say. Go back and find it. Because it yeah. actually, it is a very beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, piece. yeah, I bet. But the idea that like Cheever, and Cheever's a writer, I still hold close. Like those yeah. short stories, man. And and certainly Wapshaw, there's some other novels where I'm like, eh, not so much. But yeah. the stories and the first Wapshaw novel are, to me, like, I, both of my original copies are, like, tattered and falling apart. And it's just because you go back to them again and again and again. Yeah. I don't necessarily want to lose that connection to mm-hmm. Cheever. There are other writers, like Henry Miller. I really don't ever need to read Henry Miller again. Like, I'm good. <laughs> I actually try to, re- like, you know, Miller's one of those people you read when you're 18 and you're like, oh, my God, this is great. This is the you know, and your eyes get big. And then you go back later. (laughs) Oh man, I was just like, wow. Yeah, yeah. And I think, yes, the way you feel about Cheever, I feel about Roth, where I, you know, read and reread Ghostwriter and American Pastoral and Human Stain. I think that my my reading of those books changes over the years, which I think is, you know, one of the joys of returning to books that you love. But you know, what I always still love is, is that investigation of the person telling the story and, you know, how that shapes the story that's being told. You know, it's funny the way you talk about Roth too, because I have finally officially given up the ghost on um, American <laughs> I know, Pastoral. I know, we have very different... No, well, here's Roth the thing. Ways. So my, my copy finally went with, to the donate pile yeah. because I, and it was... <laughs> I like pointing this out only because this is how long I've had it. It was like a $12 trade paperback. Like I had had it for a really long time because I was like, I need to read this book. Yes, I did. In fact, it moved from like Chicago to New York. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, every time I picked it up and like, I get it. I've read the criticism. I've listened to other people talk about this book. The sweet as a character fascinates me. His daughter, like all of the ideas of this novel fascinate me. Yeah. And by all accounts, by everything, I can't do it. I finally just had to get, I just finally had to admit that this book and I were just never going to connect. And you know, like life's too short to keep trying to bludgeon a book into being something that you want to consume. You know, there are so many books that you do read and love. So why just let it go on to the next? It's just so <laughs> funny to me. Like, 
really, I had to scream uncle. I was just like, I can't, I can't do it. I really, yeah. you know, and when I hear people riff on what their idea of canon should be, yeah. I also think canon needs to change, yeah. right? Like it, canon should not be stuck in time. Like, okay, I'm going to take a really goofy kind of example for a second, but like Arthurian legend mm -hmm. or any of that kind of sort of old English, like Beowulf, all of that yeah. kind of, it has its place, but like, it doesn't mean we can't have new translations, right? And I have to admit, I'm not a, not a Beowulf scholar but i but i feel that way about the odyssey you know like yes I, okay I like emily wilson right exactly different different interpretations and different translations of the odyssey it's, it's so fascinating and and really interesting and just for the purposes of the show notes too uh, maria devana headley is the translator i'm thinking of, of this new edition yeah. of beowulf but yeah like emily wilson got me to read the odyssey again as humans <laughs> <perception> <laughs> change, you know. Like, of course, uh, I think some some literature is the reason why it sticks around is because it speaks to things that continue to be right. relevant. You know, the idea that only one perspective is worthy of carrying on is that's sad and limiting. Martin doesn't strike me as a dude who's thinking the canon needs to be expanded. <laughs> no, I think that's Martin's the only change that Martin make would make to the canon is to insert himself into it. I right. Think. That's yeah. yeah. And part of me though wonders, you know, talking to Sal. All right. And yes, we're about to do the, oh, we're talking about a fictional character like she's real, but we are. The idea of talking to Sal about what her idea of canon is, we don't really hear her talking about writers outside of Martin, even just giving context, right? Like I'm yeah. not saying we need her reading list or anything like that, but I get the feeling that women writers are not necessarily sitting at the front of her brain, right? Like she's one of, you know, she's Roth, reading Updike she wrote, and yeah, yeah, Franzen. And yes, yes. You know, because there's this idea, or was this idea, which I hope is being challenged a little more, that only a certain kind of person could write literary fiction. I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> actually, let's have this conversation. And I did an event recently in one of our stores where one of the audience questions referenced you know literary fiction being something that sort of only white dudes did and I was like well we can take this conversation offline I'm happy because we were in the middle of another event for something else yeah is it a younger person who asked it was <laughs> it was and she was very groovy um and she's very smart and we had a very nice conversation about it but what passes for literary and who decides and yeah some of it's just straight up marketing okay we know this yeah. I do love to read something that I know someone has aggressively thought about the sentence level work. Yes. Right. And you were one of those people. Like, it's just, you slide in these moments. And again, I don't want to reveal anything just because it's so much fun to read this book, but you get these lines in where suddenly you know exactly who that person is or who, who they were in that moment, I should say. And that is really satisfying to me. And so much happens in your very old fashioned novel, my friend. <laughs> I'm guessing there are a couple of drafts of this book that you completely threw out the window and reworked. Yes. I, I mean, mean, not because I can see the seams, but it's just, it's so seamless. So and much and much seamless much. doesn't show up. Yeah, seamless doesn't show up because you just went, hi, here's my draft and I bombed through it and here you go. It's, seamless is hard. Yeah, I mean, so much of it was just trying to fit these different people together. I could I couldn't even tell you the number of drafts and half drafts. And you know, and then when I was fortunate enough to start working with uh, my agents, then we, we went through revisions. And then when I started working with the editors, then <laughs> more revisions. I think what I really love, you know, when I'm reading is when there are those moments where there are sort of these transitions happening or, or, you know, there are sort of subtle interactions between people that are maybe like blowing things up more mm. either for the characters than the reader understands or yeah, for yeah. The, the characters understand. And yeah, it takes, takes, I certainly was not able to do that in a first draft. <laughs> but in general, I mean, you're covering what, 50 something years, almost 50 yeah. years, right? Ish. Yeah. Okay. So if art reflects our culture, right? Mm -hmm. Which we know 
but that's kind of primary yes. purpose, right? <laughs> that's primary purpose of the novel is capture time, reflect our culture. The way you play with women's roles in this book and the way you play with marriage, which is kind of the anchor, yeah, like partnership and marriage and relationships are the anchor of this novel in a way that I didn't necessarily expect. I mean, we live in the 21st century, like, I mean, you know how I feel about marriage. <laughs> what is it? Like, is it, th- is it that much of a primary primordial thing, marriage that we can't not talk about it? I think, well, I think one thing is I really did not want to write about romantic relationships. That was, I was really, for whatever reason, maybe because I did, I had this sort of internalized feeling that if you are a woman writing about a relationship, then that's sort of immediately putting you in a particular box. Um, But, you know, like going through the world, you fall in love with people and you break up and uh, you decide to have children or you decide not to have children. And every gender makes those same (laughs) decisions. It's, It's just that for whatever reason, it historically maybe has seemed less serious when it has been anybody but a straight man writing about that. Like, I do really think that that is changing and and has changed. I, you know, have complicated feelings, as I'm sure, you know, most people do about being a woman in a relationship. And I am, you know, a straight woman in a relationship. And and so all, all of that comes out on the page. And I think also, I'm really interested in the difference in, in the way d- different generations handle parenthood and partnership. And so that ended up being, uh, you know, that, that comes out, I think, in the book. Moira is a mother. The, the, her relationship with her own mother is also in the book. And then Martin uh, loses his mother very, you know, very young and, and his father isn't really ever in the picture. So I think there are different, different parenthood dynamics that are going on as well. And I think that parenthood and partnership, you know, are so hand in hand too. So it's all in there. (laughs) It's true. It is all in there. But I'm also thinking about the fact that, you know, so many people think of the 1960s as this like pivotal point of change in America Mm -hmm. kind of thing culturally, socially. People just kind of overlook the 70s, which was like total chaos. Everyone was raised by wolves. The yeah. 70s were a mess. <laughs> and, you know, here's Martin sort of holding on to the past in a really different way. Mara's like, I'm going to go be a scientist. So y'all, I like, I will have my child and she loves her husband. She loves her child. But she's like, and while I'm at it, I'm going to solve, you know, X, Y, and Z equation and everything yeah. else. And I love the idea that Moira is actually a little clueless when it comes to the world around her. Like, she's just kind of like, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. I'm just going to do this. Like, I don't, you don't ever hear her talking about what she's watching or reading or like, she talks about planets. She talks about her family. Like, I've never really met anyone like Moira before. There are are some scientists in my life. Okay. Um, (laughs) And my mom grew up in, uh, partially in Houston in during the space race and um, and then had sort of these like basically godparents who who were um, scientists who were working for uh, NASA and doing all kinds of wild things and so as a little girl they were they were part of my life since then I have have acquired uh, <laughs> acquired various scientific minds my husband is a a scientist who sort of thinks about the world in a very different way than I do is, um, you know, I think that's a really nice kind of relationship to have. For Moira, she is so, it it's very helpful to her in certain aspects that she is able to sort of be a little bit monomaniacal about what she's interested in. Um, but then she also, you know, runs up against certain circumstances where she's sort of reminded of her place in the world. She just assumes that if she is good enough at something, then she'll be good enough at something. And then it, you know, it turns out that there are 
other aspects of play. She's also a little bit, I mean, some of what she does and some of what she believes are, usually is given to a dude Yeah. in a piece of art, whether it's a film or a book or, or what have you. And it's fun watching her just sort of be Moira on the page. Like she's oh, just, glad. she's a great character. And I also, I don't want to sound like I'm being dismissive of Sal at all. I could not turn away from her. She <laughs> it made me itch a little bit. But I would much rather have a character make me itch a little bit than think, oh, I don't need to finish this. I don't need to know what happens yeah. to this person. Like I needed to know because I had an idea where you were going yeah. and I'm delighted to say, well, I was not wrong, um, <laughs> but it was really fun getting there. It was yeah. really, really super fun getting there. But part of me wonders, I mean, you talk to people who are parts of all different kinds of major art moments whether it's music or film or television whatever and here you are writing a novel yeah why (laughs) I mean obviously why not but like seriously you're working like your scale is a little different yeah I have just always loved novels like Mm -hmm. that's just what you know I love watching movies but I you know my parents would have to stop me from reading a book when I crossed the street when I was little, you know, like, (laughs) and I don't know why we love the things that we do, but it just has always been books. And it sort of feels like a compulsion. I think that, you know, Mm -hmm. both my parents are classical musicians and they just have to make music. You know, they retired a, a couple of years ago now, but they still play and they still like, if you have that, it just, like it doesn't you know it's not so easy to just do other things I feel like physically sick when I have gone too long without writing fiction and so I don't know what it is I just love them (laughs) I love novels (laughs) is it the journey itself I mean that's slightly cliched but that's essentially what a novel is it's a journey right like that's the thing That's the thing that keeps you turning pages. That's the thing that gets you invested in the characters, whether it's their journey, like if it's a physical thing or a mental thing. And I just, even when the subject is not fun, the art is fun. Yeah, yeah. And that it, you know, it takes you out of time in this particular way that other things do. And, you know, like now that, you know, miniseries and streaming and that you can binge a TV show for, you know, 30 hours if you want to. Uh, You can do that. But I think for so long, books were sort of this, the primary long form uh, narrative art form that you sat with for an extended period of time. And I think that there is something very powerful about that. And, um, and it does like it, it just changes the way you think, I think when you're, I think, probably anyone who has ever like try to keep a diary, especially when you're younger. And, you know, when I, and I've been a very, I'm very sporadic, bad diary keeper. But when I look back at things I was writing when I was 14 or 15, like I knew exactly what I was reading at that time, because it's like, oh, like, here is the Didion stage. Here is the Austin. Here is the, you know, whatever. And, you know, I think it, it sort of like rewires your brain to live in somebody else's voice for a long period of time. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, when I think of some of the writers that I really glommed onto when I was a teenager, like Joan Didion, right? Like mm-hmm. when you and I were coming up, YA was not quite the thing it is now. No. So, you know, you start punching above your weight really quickly. There's still so much Didion I love. and the, But to go back to those sentences and to go back and to think about how sort of revelatory the whole experience was, you know, when you're 13, 14, 15, and you're suddenly here's this woman who sort of appears out of the mist, right? Yeah. <laughs> leaning yeah. against her Corvette and you're like, I'm sorry, what is happening here? This is not like any from? adult I've ever seen in my life. Like, I don't even understand what is happening and what I'm, re- and you know, I, my eyes are getting big just thinking about it. Yeah. And how much you can shift your perception of the world. And here's Sal, who's sort of inherited Martin's way of thinking more than Moira's way of thinking, right? Yes. Like Sal's inquisitive, but, you know, like you were saying earlier in the show, you were like, well, sometimes you walk into an interview, you know exactly what you want to do. And yeah. then it whiffs because, yeah. you know, there's no, 
give and take, right? Yeah. And then there are times where, I mean, I've there are times where I have sat down to do an interview and I throw out my entire, and you just go, yeah. okay. Here we go. Like along for the ride of wherever yep. this person like, is. Yeah. <laughs> none of this script matters. Not yeah. a whit of research matters. We're just, yeah. we're going to go. And <laughs> oftentimes it's really, really great. Yeah. I mean, it really, like, there are times where you're just like, okay. And also editing changes the way you interview. Like, I mean, yeah. learning to physically edit audio, which I did early on in the show, it changed the way that I interview without a doubt. But no, I think about this all the time. Like when, you know, I think probably like a lot of people, there's a certain anxiety about the AI situation (laughs) going on right now. And like, I just, I hate the idea that, you know, that there's any possibility that, that AI could start, you know, creating the, the, books that we're reading but i and i think the thing that probably will keep that from happening is that and i am certainly not an expert in like neural networks or you know uh, natural language processing or whatever but like the way that works is that it's sort of it's picking one sentence and then figuring out what would come from from in the next sentence and uh, you know based on everything that's ever been written in the history of the world. And I think what's so incredible about human brains is that they don't always work like that. And that I think when you're reading a book, the sort of most exciting moments are when the thing that happens next is building from what's happened before, but is an unexpected moment. You know, like we don't want to just be sort of trailing along on, you know, the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. I think like what we like about human interactions and I think that reading books is a human interaction is that people surprise you and, and disappoint you and, you know, do that, that there are all these ways that, that people are not machines. (laughs) And um, for most, for the most part, I I think that people writing books are always going to have that just a little, a little leg up over. Without a doubt. I mean, story is such a human need, right? Yeah. It's like eating and sleeping and breathing yeah. for some of us, right? Like, I just tell me a story. Yeah. Tell me a story. And, you know, I don't know where it's going to go, but that's what I appreciated about meeting these characters. I had some idea of where I was and what was going on, but you always sort of kept me on my toes, which I, that's not easy to do. One, You read a lot. I I read a lot. And I was just like, (laughs) it's also why I don't watch a lot of television because I don't have time. Like you got to choose. Right. But certainly Sal and Moira and Martin kept me guessing. And there were a couple of moments where, you know, my, my notes were not fit for a family newspaper. (laughs) <laughs> as the kids say, they never settled into cliche. They never settled into, oh, right, I know where this is going because I've read this before. It was always kind of like, well, I know how your brain works and I have an idea of where we're going, but it was a really excellent journey. Oh, I'm so, so pleased to hear that. That makes me so happy. Yeah, because I just, I really liked the way you balanced backstory. And the present. And again, there are characters that we've left out because it is a very tight cast, which I appreciated it too. It's a yeah. very, very tight cast. But there's some stuff that could be revealed. And there's some moments in those relationships that were really satisfying. Oh, they were God. so, so satisfying. And um, the one thing I will say is you make a reference to a novel called The Wife. <laughs> <laughs> and that made me laugh out loud. And I'm not going to tell yeah. people where it is. When you get to it, you will know it. Yeah. You'll know it when you see it. And I just laughed out loud when I saw that. I was like, okay. Well, and she's very, you know, that is a book that um, I read later in, I, I hadn't, I hadn't read it. I, then I, I, I read another Meg Walter book and then I read The Wife. And, you know, that investigation of that kind of literary so partnership. Sad. It's so satisfying. It's so good. It's so, so good. And in a lot of ways, it feels like Moira is sort of like the anti-literary wife. And Mm -hmm. that all all these, all these authors 
you know, the Nabokovs and, uh, you know, Philip Roth's first wife, um, Margaret Martinson, who I, I like, I think I read a, um, I don't know if it was in one of his, uh, an obituary or I don't know where it was. But he had a very difficult relationship with, with that, with his first wife. And then she died a decade later. Um, and the note was something like, and you know, that put a significant dent on his literary output or something like that. And I just thought like, what a wild, like, regardless of what was going on, like what a wild sort of little footnote to have on a person's life, you know, that the, the importance of this, of this person is that she, you know, changed how, <laughs> changed how somebody was, was writing. And, you know, of course it's more complicated than that. And, mm-hmm. and but. Sal even goes into meeting Moira sort of expecting that she's getting that kind of person and is sort of hoping that Moira is going to, you know, like be her, her husband, her husband's like biographer assistant, you know, and, and she doesn't do that. So playing around with some of those dynamics was, was fun to do. Have you started working on the next thing? I have started. Oh, good. (laughs) <laughs> okay yes it takes place in san francisco and it's about a group of friends and uh well, i'm a couple years into it and we'll see okay. where it goes <laughs> we can wait be patient <laughs> i mean honestly you did i mean you took the right amount of time for the myth maker so i mean i'm certainly not saying I'm hoping this one goes a little bit quicker. I do think that so much of, you know, I rewrote the first like couple chapters of The Myth Makers for for three years. Like I just could not figure out how to get Sal out of New York, basically. Like I, I And I think I was just anxious about, you know, like what was coming next. And everyone writes in different ways. And I think that some people really need to get things perfectly as they go along. But I think maybe even, I don't know what came first, but Definitely in magazine writing, it's much easier for me to write a full draft, big, messy, you know, bloated situation that then I can sort of chisel down and refine. And I found finally, if when I just did that with the draft of this book, that then I had something to work with. So lucky us. Get it out now. Lucky us. Lucky us. Yeah. And, you know, of course, this happened because I'm looking in the corner of my screen and we ran down time as I totally <laughs> we ran down the clock again. So, cause I aware it is always really, really good oh, to see it's you. It's just such a pleasure to talk to you. I also just, I mean, I, I have said this behind the scenes, but you just are such a like just beam of light in, in my literary world. So, and so many people's. So thank, well, you. thank you for that. And right back at you, but the myth makers is out now and everyone should just go read it. I'm Ewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over and Wait Until You Hear About My Murder by Katie Williams. And luckily, Katie is here because <laughs> this book is wild. Katie, this book is so wild and so unexpected. It zigs when you think it's going to zag and there's all sorts of great stuff going on. But I have to tell you something before we get started. It, I thought this was going to be a ghost story. <laughs> okay, it's fair. It's fair. Yeah, it's called my murder, so... I I know it's called my murder, but at the same time, like, really, we've got cloning, we've got artificial intelligence, we've got video games, and we've got a really cool woman called Lou who's trying to piece it all together. But I really, I honestly, I was kind of like, well, okay, so ghost story, whatever, you know, this is great. And the voice is fantastic. And Lou is great. And her husband, Silas, is a pretty good dude. But where did this book come from? <laughs> I love that you said it was a wild read because I just I wanted it to just be such a good time because it it came out of my my deep, deep fandom, my love of of murder mysteries. Yeah. So I wanted to put all the things I love about murder mysteries and thrillers into this book. And at the same time, it came out of this kind of sort of uncomfortable feeling I sometimes have about being a murder mystery reader and fan, which is that there's, you know, often uh, a dead woman in the center of the floor. And the whole book is about everyone else, you know, trying to figure out who killed her, what happened to her. And she's just sort of there and not active at all in what is arguably her story. And so I, I asked myself if there was a way I could 
bring her back, not like through flashbacks, but but literally onto the page. And, and that's where that's where Luke came from. She she is both the murder victim and, you know, the main character and eventually, you know, sort of the investigator of of her murder. So I really like her as a character. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. She's a really good stand in for the audience, too, because sometimes, you know, you get the detective who's so raw. It's just like, OK, hurry up. Even I figured this out because <laughs> I read a lot of this, you know, not to be impatient about these things, but you know what I'm talking about. I get it. And then there are other times where you're like, of course, you're nine steps ahead of us, Sherlock Holmes, because you're noticing all of the things that mere mortals do not. So, yay. And she's kind of the perfect mix of what happened to me? Where am I? And who are these people and what are they trying to get out of me? Yeah, yeah. I mean, as a detective, it's it's emotional for her. Right. Because it's, it's her it's her own life. Um, and this thing that's happened to her that she is asking questions about and looking into. And yeah, and then all the people in her life around her become, I don't know, questionable. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's hiding something in this book. Mm. Even her very yeah. nice husband, Silas, very yeah. nice guy, but he's hot. Everyone is hiding. One of her dads, Odd, who is a character I quite like, he's hiding something. And she has a support group. We need to talk about the ladies for a second because the ladies are excellent. Uh, yay. <laughs> but it's a pretty trippy support group. And I think we can talk about this in a way that doesn't give anything away. I think we can do that. Yeah. Would you introduce Lou's fellow support group women? Because... They're wild. This is so good. This is so good. These women. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Well, they they are there are five women joined by a singular singular experience, which is that they are all victims of the same serial killer, Edward Early, and they have been through. It, my book takes place in the near future. This government backed and overseen cloning program that has brought them back, um, and so they're in a emotional support group that's the serial killer survivors support group yeah um so there's there's fern lacy jasmine angela and then and then our protagonist lou um and they're working through you know what's happened to them and they're also dealing with and um, because because these murders were big news mm -hmm. yep. serial killer murders can be they're dealing with a strange sort of celebrity that they have as these true crime victims who have been brought back to life. I mean, I know you're saying it's set in the near future, but my murder is very of the moment. It is so super of the moment. And I realize you have to step out in a way, right? Like you've created this sort of dystopian landscape that's just familiar enough. I mean, it sounds like there are self-driving cars, but beyond that, like it really is a world that we would quickly recognize except for you know the cloning part <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah I, I mean I, I love reading science fiction too but for me when I write it and this was true with my last book tell the machine good night I just like to inch out into the future a little bit that's a place that feels very very real to me and sort of textured and lived in um where where I can sort of let my imagination um play uh so yeah yeah it's not it's not spaceships or anything. It's really a world that I think is recognizable. It's totally recognizable. And it, it does to me too. It sort of feels a little bit like living online. And I know I alluded to video games and, and there is a video game that is a piece of this book. And we're not going to go into too much detail about the video game because it might give some stuff up. But, you know, this idea that, you know, you need the online, like Lou's job. Can we talk about Lou's job for a second? Because it's yes. wild, this job. <laughs> Yeah, this is um, a job that actually exists, though not in this format right now. So, okay. she, yeah, she's a a professional. They call her a professional hugger, but like she, she, yeah, she holds people for a living, and, and that's a real job. I think a very important job. But um, because we're just a little bit out in the future, um, she does it through um, like a virtual reality. They're called skins in the novel. So both she and her clients are in a sort of virtual space and appear in as, as they would like to. It's that virtual space that made me sort of stop for a second. I mean, I get the, like people are, some people are uh, starved for touch. I mean, we saw this obviously early in lockdown and whatnot, that it was really hard for a lot of people. And I'm not making light of that at all, but this idea that you have to put on 
a, an entirely different persona, right? Like a physical persona in order to connect with another human being. I mean, it's social media. In, right, exactly. Like, I mean, it, it's the exact metaphor for social media. And I'm just wondering too, like as you're sitting down to create this, because also this book moves, like Thank you. I flew through this story, partially short chapters, partially I needed to know what was going on. Partially, I just didn't know how quickly I was moving through it because of the way you write, all of which is great, but you're juggling characters, you're juggling devices, you're juggling world building, you're doing all of these things in a really tightly written I mean, this is what, 275 pages, maybe like it's, yeah, it is, it is very mm -hmm. tightly written this book. So how are you juggling all of these bits? And yeah, I mean, the obvious answer is you're the writer, it's your job, but can we talk about process for a second? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. It took me a while to find my way into this book. I knew, I knew Lou and I knew some things that were going to happen in it. But, uh, but I I wrote for a while just trying to really stay centered in character, I think in part because I knew I was writing, you know, a clone. So I needed to push past that idea, a simulacrum of someone to the actual person. And so for a while, I'm so glad to hear you say you, you flew through it because for a while, it was just sort of murky territory with me just hanging with the characters. I tell my students that it's if they can trick their minds, I, I teach if they can trick their minds into thinking of character and plot as, as one element instead of two fictional elements, that's ideal. And I wasn't taking my own advice. I was just, I mean, we were, it was like a hot summer afternoon and the characters and I were like lounging on couches with washcloths on our foreheads. You know, I needed to shake myself out of it. And you know what I, I actually did is I, I had read Long Bright River by Liz Moore. I don't know if oh. you've read that book. And that moves, but also like with such a center around character. And so I stripped it down for parts kind of, not, that's the wrong analogy, but I, I did a reverse outline of it. And I looked at like how she, how she built her structure. And then I thought about like, how can I do the same with my characters? Yeah. I mean, I realize obviously we are talking about, you know, murder mystery as a trope, right? Like, I mean, so many great mysteries, so many great thrillers written and published, you know, every year. I you will never, if it is a genre you love to read, you will never run out of books to read. I promise you will never run out of things to read. And that's the terrible thing and the wonderful thing. Yeah, right? right? Like, it's very cool. But at the same time, like, I love what you're doing, too, because it's really lose murder. And I'm not going to give up all the details, but it's lose murder in this continuum that sort of kicks off everyone, all of the women in the support group being cloned because she's a wife and she's a mother. And I mean, you're taking a really big political moment, a big potent political moment. And I think it's kind of cool to build a fun, entertaining read around it. Like we don't have to always read the big heavy thing, the big heavy exploration, right? Like we should be having these conversations in our art, you know, because our art reflects our culture and all that kind of stuff. So I'm wondering. Did you start with that piece? Is that where this all came from? It wasn't just the character, but it was also this moment where it's like some people are valued more than others. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And and also this question about like in so much of our art and, mm -hmm. and especially the genre, which as you say, is yeah. reflection, our lives. Um, like why is it kind of romantic or titillating somehow when there's this certain murder victim, like the sort of Laura Palmer murder victim at the right. center. What's that about? And I don't know that I even like have answers because when mm -hmm. I write, I just try to arrive at more questions. But yeah, ab absolutely. It was, yeah, this idea of the quote unquote perfect or ideal murder victim and what that says. And the way too that you let each of these women in the support group sort of explore their own anger. There, there are different levels of response, right? To being brought back to what happened to them the sort of fame that comes along with things. Everyone has a very different response. And um, Fern, <laughs> she's a pistol and she's a little bit of a weirdo in a good way, but she's a little bit of a weirdo. And she sort of keeps things going. And two, she has a pretty big arc. I mean, all of everyone has their own arc, but hers, like stuff happens. Stuff really, really happens. But, you know, she gets some stuff, Lou gets some stuff. And I love the way it's balanced because their lives are not exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. And Fern, 
she she doesn't get left behind. And I appreciate she's not just a sidekick. And I appreciate that. when you realize you've got Lou and Silas and you know you're going to have to create some other women. Right. Mm. Who showed up after Lou? Like, mm-hmm. how did the women come to be? Oh, gosh. So this. Uh, here's the second chapter in the book. The first chapter out this, uh, the support group was originally the first chapter. So oh, wow. we're all sitting. Yeah. Yeah. And then it was, we needed a little more because <laughs> it was a lot of characters to be introducing at once, a lot of situation. Yeah. So I had them all sitting in those chairs pretty early on and they haven't, you know, they've been themselves the entire time. I mean, they I've gotten to know them better as characters, but no one drastically changed. I like what you said about Fern. She's definitely a character that I could use to as a catalyst to shake things up, which <laughs> Then, you know, I think Lou has kind of a friend crush on her. That was fun to work with. Yeah. And then I had Angela pretty early as a character that the other women are sort of prickly toward and sometimes mm-hmm. in sometimes ways I, that, I found, <laughs> that I found understandable. She's someone who has embraced the celebrity and almost uses it for empowerment eventually, I yeah. think. I, I don't think that's a spoiler at all. Yeah. I had some moments with her where I was like, you're not actually better than these other women. Like she really thinks very highly of herself because she just, she's doing things in a way where she's like, well, and no one else is really going to keep up with her because she's Angela. And mm. she is just that person who's well ahead of everyone else and in a place where she can do different things. And everyone else is kind of like, well, I... And I like the contrast, but yeah, I had a couple of moments with her where I was kind of ready to flick her on the air and be like, lady, what? Good, good. Yeah, no, she's <laughs> she meant to be a little annoying in the chat. Yeah, but again, like she's annoying for the right reasons. And I'm laughing a little bit too, because you and I are talking about fictional characters, like they're real people, but yeah, right. honestly, I would have flicked her on the air completely. Yeah, I mean, for me, yeah, they are for me, right? They're my yeah, yeah. imaginary friends, as Charlie Chan Anders would say, yeah. You do this a little bit, well, more than a little bit in your earlier novel too, The Tell Machine Goodnight from 2018, where it's that intersection of technology and human everything, human frailty, human, just being human, right? Like we're messy. Yeah, we are. <laughs> we're messy. No one likes to, yeah. we're messy. But, you know, not just Lou's job and not just obviously the cloning part where we bring women back. But just in general, like this idea that technology is just so omnipresent that we don't even really think about it. And yet, like you have characters who are lonely and you have characters who don't know how to be around people in a way that actually helps them, like the characters themselves kind of thing. And and watching that dance is pretty cool. When you're building a world like this and you're balancing the humanity of it all, right? Like, because if it's all tech, it's not necessarily that interesting. Mm. And if it's all the people, it's not my murder. (laughs) Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you've got this sort of merging of genre and style and voice and all of these different things. So how? (laughs) <laughs> when why <laughs> yeah. I mean I, I will say I had a lot more tech in it and my very very smart editor um suggested I pull some of that out because it was just distracting from the characters but in general and this was true until the machine I, I like to look for moments where the technology reveals character so reveals desire or fear and that issue that you brought up earlier that I know I'm by far not the first person to say this, but how technology can sometimes give us the illusion of being closer to each other, but also distance and separate us from each other. I think that that tension, that's really interesting to me as a writer and, and a person. I mean, it's a narrative device that's really useful. <laughs> I mean, yeah. not all of us want to think about our social media accounts being sort of narrative devices. But if you think about what you decide to post on your own feed versus a corporate feed or what have you, like there are some people who really live online every minute. And I'm sometimes I'm amazed and other times I'm looking through my fingers kind of thing. But I'm sort of very deliberate about how I live online because I'm not necessarily sure there's information that I would want to share with people that I only see twice a year. Yeah, there's also 
when you start, you know, posting online a lot, you start in your life, or at least I do, thinking about like, oh, like <laughs> on this beautiful hike, like, wouldn't this be a good Instagram photo? And that feels like it's sort of cannibalizing one's actual like life experiences in a way. It's yeah, it's a little trip. Like if you think about it, you know, when I was growing up, we didn't have camera phones in our pockets at all times, right? Like the stuff now and there are times where I'll just take a photo for reference like signs so I remember where something is kind of thing (laughs) not necessarily for you know the art of it all and the the serendipity of getting photos back when they're printed right and you're like I have no idea if anything's going to show up until you open up the envelope and it's like oh and sometimes it's great and sometimes you're like what did I do and now you can just be like oh yeah I don't like that one delete that represents exactly what I want it to represent and it may not actually be that thing in real life but wow it makes a great photo it's not like Lou is posting her experience to social media, but it feels like she's living in that way where she's like, I don't know what piece makes more sense. And watching her puzzle it out is really, I mean, it's the soul of the book, but it's terrific. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I mean, there's this way in which you're sort of curating and crafting your own identity online. And I mean, I think it becomes an exaggeration maybe of, of the ways we craft, actually craft our identities in our lives. You are a graduate of Michener at University of Texas. Yes. Which is a great, pro- I mean, so many great writers have come out of that program. I mean, and actually I have to say, when I saw that James Hanahan had blurbed, yeah, yeah, so delicious food. Can we talk about delicious foods for a second? I'm still listening Please. to Carlotta. I have not finished oh. Carlotta, so we can't go to Carlotta. Oh, Carlotta it's so anyway. good. It's so good. Okay, but yeah. Delicious Foods and Scotty. And the reason I'm bringing it up, because I'm sure there are people who are listening here like, what is this tangent? You know, Scotty's voice in Delicious Foods and this character's voice is so real and so vibrant and it really drives the story. And you're doing that, you know, in a, in a different way. But it's, again, it's that voice thing. I'm just... I love the idea that you guys both came out of this sort of very hardcore MFA program telling great stories with really good voices. And uh, were you guys in the same class? Well, I was just going to say that you're bringing James up in this interview about my book is just I I admire his work so much. We were in the same graduating class since since we are doing video on this. I know. Can I grab something from Oh, yeah, totally, totally, totally. Please. (laughs) <laughs> this is an odd item that James gifted me for my last birthday. Okay, wait, it's a glass bowl sitting in a tree? What is this? Yeah, I found it in an art shop in Providence, which is where, where okay, I rock yeah, on. Yeah, but just, um, yeah, no, James is a dear friend. We are in the um, same cohort. We're in the same year. He inspires and challenges me in my work and has since we were, you know, a number of years ago in our MFA program together. I love this idea too, because also, you know, there's so much conversation swirling around in publishing and, you know, online in a million different places where it's like genre, not genre. I only read genre. I never read genre. And I just, I like this idea of being able to use whatever tools you need to tell the story, right? Like you started at the top of the show by saying, well, I have this kind of love hate thing with murder mystery. I got to tell you, true crime actually makes me rather uncomfortable. And I understand why people like it. And I understand that there are people like I get it's just it's not for me. It's it's not for me. It's not a storytelling that I can, you know, glom onto. But then you've got like Rebecca Mackay's last novel. (laughs) And she even has a character who comes out and says, like, it's a little icky. But like, whatever you need to tell the story. Right. And so when did you sort of realize that you wanted to play? with sort of these ideas of sci-fi and fantasy or let's call it voice right like what Hannah and what James is doing in delicious foods certainly with that voice yeah I I really I read that in a single sitting and I just I still love delicious foods to bits that book is it's so good it's astounding yeah well I mean one thing I'd say is that you know these genres exist because people have been telling they've been using the these tools or these you know tropes as my students call them over and over again so there's something there that we are as humans trying to express that you know is endlessly interesting to us that we can't find you know whether it's fantasy whether it's sci-fi whether it's mystery um so cracking 
open what that is is really um, interesting to me as a writer. Yeah. And then, yeah, beyond that, like, well, what you said, whatever tools you have at hand Mm -hmm. to, 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 to create the art. It's a lot of fun for me. So Tell the Machine, my last book, (laughs) it's a speculative novel. Maybe it's science fiction, some people might say, but, you know, there's a like, you know, governess and a haunted house story in it. There's a hard boiled mystery story in it. Yeah. So it's just incredibly satisfying and endlessly interesting for me as a writer to play around with these genres and put them together and see what they say about us. Sometimes I wonder too, like, you know, when you're a kid and you're reading and rereading something because you know sort of how it's going to play out, right? Or you're rewatching something because you know how it's going to play out. And I'm not saying we're looking to see, you know, repetition per se, but it, there's something really comforting about knowing sort of what beats something might hit. I, and I'm not saying you know the details of the thing, but this idea that you kind of know what's going on, but you get to challenge yourself a little bit, like, you know, a locked room mystery, right? And sometimes those are really satisfying. And sometimes you're like, it just depends, right? Like, it just depends on how the art is executed. And I'm not sure I would have met Lou. Like if you had sort of written a very standard dead woman, husband, baby, let's figure out who did it kind of story. I'm not necessarily sure I would have been bouncing on the balls of my feet the way I am about my murder. I think it's partially like the device and the tools that you're using to tell the story that make it so interesting and so fun and so weird in a good way. For me. Thanks. Yeah. So can we talk about some of your other influences, though? I mean, obviously, James, like classmate, but also I can see sort of the similarities and sensibilities and and how you both sort of approach writing. But who are some of the other writers who made Katie Williams, Katie Williams? Oh, just just in general. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Ursula K. Le Guin is one of my favorite favorites for all time. Rest in power. That what she does in science fiction and fantasy to show ourselves. Yeah, stunning, stunning. Some of my favorite mystery writers. I yeah. taught French. You know, it's because the mystery is all about showing, revealing these characters. Um, yeah, and then Flynn Flynn Berry um, writes um, such beautiful mysteries her prose her art was something I thought about a lot while writing this all of that is really interesting but you started writing YA which I did not know I mean I knew because tell the machine uh good night was nominated for Kirk it was a finalist for the Kirkus prize so I knew that was out in the way you know I, I knew about that book at least but I didn't honestly know about the YA before I sat down to start doing the research for this show so why the switch? What are you? Was there something you weren't getting from writing YA that just made you say, I'm going to try this other thing? Because you also write short stories as well. But like, where's where's that line for you? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I didn't start out intending to write YA. I just happened to have a lot of teenage characters in my short stories is what I started on. And I still love that form. I haven't written a short story in a while, but my first book, Space Between Trees, published as a young adult, but I didn't write it as young adult. My agent took it out of it and we got offers for both young adult and adult. And we we went with Chronicle Books, which was a great first home for me. Um, And it published at young adult. um, And I did a second book for them. And yeah, I I mean, I, I loved writing young adult and I might again, I don't know, no plans, but I don't know. It wasn't like I sat down and decided like, I'm going to write an adult novel. When I wrote Tell the Machine, it started as a short story and then grew. And it, it happened to be about, you know, a, a woman in her 40s. And so I think that more naturally placed it in adult lit. Um, but she has a teenage son who's a very important. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, remember his name. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I guess like with the genre thing, I, I, I don't know if I'm so like tear the walls down, you know, like I'm, right. oh. yeah. I think, you know, watching people move out of their comfort zone, whether they're writing or reading is always kind of fun. And I always just want to ask, like, what was it really like? Because I mean, honestly, you're not necessarily getting an MFA to learn 
I mean, there's so many pieces of MFA and I'm certainly like, there's so many sort of artificial lines that get drawn between MFA, non-MFA, this, that it, it's, it's kind of wild. I think that's sort of a human response to want to categorize everything, but maybe you just have to tell the story. Yeah. And I, you know, I now teach in an MFA program. In fact, I teach in two MFA programs at Emerson College. Well, they're both under Emerson, housed under Emerson, and one is in residence program which is the more standard literary fiction. We do other genres too. Literary program. The the other program is the popular fiction MFA. And they do define it there by genre. So, you know, it's science fantasy, romance, mystery, thriller, and writers who are working in those areas. That's a super good idea. I have to say, because whenever I think of Emerson, I actually just think of Plowshares magazine, which has been around for forever. And much of my high school career was, you know, reading as much of Plowshares as I could get my hands on because, you know, it's, I I grew up outside of Boston, but I love the idea that there are, that you recognize that there's space for everything in an academic program like that. I just, I had no idea. that (laughs) It's a celebratory space and they're all blending genres. The work they're doing in the popular fiction MFA is really amazing. What have you learned from your students? Because you've been teaching for a really long time and you've taught in different places around the country. Like this is the current place. But what have you learned over time? Well, I taught um, my previous institution, Academy of Art University in San Francisco. I was teaching creative writing was the required English class, but they weren't. Well, some of them were writers, but they were all kinds of artists. So we had, you know, graphic designers and fashion designers and sculptors and photographers and I love teaching creative writing to all those different types of artists because it gave me different vantage points and ways mm-hmm. into the work. At Emerson, I, I'm teaching creative writers now in, in MFA programs and bachelor programs that are majoring in creative writing. And they inspire me. They they reconnect me with that mm-hmm. initial like um, curiosity and excitement and those big hopes um, when you're your first sort of starting to learn and practice the craft. Um, My popular fiction MFA students have definitely taught me a ton about plot and plotting things and hooks, like making readers want to turn those pages. Yeah, I'm indebted to them. I, I, I really, I really enjoy teaching and my students are tremendously talented. Yeah, as the person who was turning pages rapidly because of you. (laughs) Thank you. Anyone who had a hand in it. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it was just, there's so many great moments where you zig instead of zag. And there are a couple of reveals in this book that were really, I'm smiling just thinking about them because they were so good. But I couldn't be lazy as I was reading. And I like that. You know, everyone reads for different reasons. There are times too where I just want to reread something because, you know, and I don't have that much opportunity to reread unless it's in the context of prepping for a show. And um, it was just fun to be really surprised. And I'm wondering if you were surprised by anything as you were working on my murder. Yeah, plot wise, you know, yeah, some things definitely came up and surprised me um, as I wrote the structure with the short chapters and some of the things that were happening with the structure. That was a surprise that came. Okay. A year or so in. Yeah. How long did it take you to write my murder? Uh, three years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was playing with the idea for a while. Actually, I, I had it initially, I had some, I mean, we're going to talk about this. This was a couple of years ago. I had a, an idea that it would be a young adult novel about a reality TV show. <laughs> and so it obviously traveled very far from that. Well, yes and no, actually. Well, I, can yeah, see, yeah. I can see how this could have Started there. I'm also, you've got me thinking about Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya's Chain Gang All Stars, which if you haven't had a chance to read, you should totally put that on your list. It's amazing. But it has a similar, you know, I can totally see how this could have started in a different direction like that. Cool, cool. Yeah. Do you miss this world that you made? No. Without giving away the ending, I feel like I, you know, did right by my character. Oh, you did. I <laughs> them in to bed and. <laughs> Yeah, I'm able to tiptoe out of the room and close the door behind me, so. No, I get that. I totally get that. It's a really satisfying organic ending. And there is, you and I talked about this a little bit before we started taping. We're just like, yeah, I really liked that thing that we can't talk about. (laughs) (laughs) We can't talk about that thing. What do you want to do next? Have you started the next thing? I mean, 
this is really complete. You've left these characters behind. I mean, you are about to put them out into the world. They're going to find their audience, but what's next? Um, I have a couple of projects in the works. One, one of which is <laughs> sitting in the corner in the time art chair. It's been giving me a little trouble. <laughs> I want to talk about that. <laughs> I do have another sort of twisty mystery. So like, I'm thinking of it as a horror comedy, actually, but it has a mystery um, thread to for sure. The author AJ Finn gave me this like really generous blurb where he said, I'm glad I didn't write this book because what would I write next? And I was like, okay, challenge accepted. What would I write next to right. try to top this one? So this was that my answer to that kind of challenge as I saw it. And it's about a middle-aged scream queen. So she worked in many years, but she was like the it girl in horror movies back when she was in her 20s. And her career has faltered. And um, someone starts murdering people using the scenes from her old movies. And so she gets drawn back into kind of the limelight through this. Okay, please write that book. (laughs) I would very much like to sell a lot of copies of that book. (laughs) It's also feeling like for fans of Grady Hendrix, they would really, really, really want to read that book. That's sort of what I'm I'm thinking there's a ready-made audience. So could you please (laughs) please have that one too? I mean, I'm delighted that my murder is here. I just, it's so much fun, but it's also, it's thoughtful and it's smart, but we can have fun too. We can have both. We can have all of the things in a novel. And I just like, I can't stress that enough. Like there's so much good stuff here. And also I do really like Lou. I think she's a great character. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Thank you. I really enjoyed my time with her. You know, it's funny when we're doing these interviews and we're trying to like dance around all the spoilers because there's so much good stuff that happens in my murder. I cannot wait for readers to meet Lou, to meet the women in her support group, especially Fern, but all of the women in the support group and also even Silas who, you know, he's Silas. I'm just going to say he's Silas. But I'm excited for readers to meet this cast and I'm really excited for people to have time with you and this novel. And my murder is just really groovy and unexpected and smart and fun and also a little thought provoking. So Katie Williams, thank you so much for joining us on Port Over and My Murder is out now. Hello readers, we're back with another TBR top off for a special double shot episode. We're going to recommend a couple of books to pick up today that go in line with today's authors. I'm Mark, I'm coming to you from my Barnes and Noble in Cincinnati and I'm joined by my book buddy Jamie who's going to kick us off. Hello Jamie. Hi Mark, I'm Jamie. I'm in Leewood, Kansas as usual. And I am here to recommend a read-along book for The Myth Makers today. As I was reading through that book and sort of unraveling all the different relationships that these women had to Martin Keller and his writing, um, and how each of their perspectives sort of formed a, a different piece of the puzzle, I was really strongly reminded of Jesse Burton's art novel, The Muse. And you might remember Jessie Burton. She had a very, very popular book called The Miniaturist, um, which I also strongly recommend. (laughs) But today I'm going to focus on The Muse, which is about a painting that a man named Lowry brings to a 1960s London art gallery, claiming that it's an inheritance from his recently deceased mother that he wants valued. He's kind of got two things going on at once. He's also there trying to impress the young Caribbean woman named Odell, who has just started working at the gallery. When she brings her boss, Marjorie, over to take a look at the painting, it causes this big stir. Marjorie goes running out of the gallery, and Odell finds out later that this painting uh, may be from a well-known artist who worked before the war named Isaac Robles. And so from there... (laughs) We completely shift gears and we move away from swinging 60s London and the indomitable Marjorie Quick and her art gallery. And we begin a new story that's set in 1930s Spain. A German man, Mr. Schloss, has moved to Andalusia with his troubled wife and their teenage daughter, Olive. Uh, Her father has some very old-fashioned expectations about her future and her mother is depressed and unpredictable. And so Olive seeks escape through art, which her father, by the way, strongly disapproves of for girls and um, strikes up a friendship with their young Spanish housekeeper, Teresa, and her charming brother, Isaac. Spain in 1936 is 
rough. It's in a state of upheaval. And politically, Isaac is a radical and Olive is really taken with him. She concocts a scheme to support him while secretly pursuing her own creative endeavors behind her father's back. And so Isaac becomes um, both her muse and her impersonator. And what follows could just all on its own be just a very compelling family drama full of politics and intrigue and love and tragedy. But what Burton's really created here are not one but two complete stories, one set in 1960s London, one in 1930s Spain. And it's clear that the painting, Lowry's Inheritance, and the gallerist, Marjorie Quick, are at the center of some, you know, 30-year-long mystery regarding its provenance. And you will just keep turning pages trying to puzzle out what's happening. Sometimes I thought I knew where it was headed, uh, but truly, it keeps you guessing right up until the last few pages. There are just revelation after revelation. Jessie Burton writes beautifully. If you read The Miniaturist, you know that. Um, her historical research and her level of detail are always really impressive. And they're Im- immersive books without being dry. Uh, it's doubly impressive to me that here in this book, because she's telling two separate historical stories at once. And she does a marvelous job of inhabiting both of those spaces simultaneously. You really do. You feel like you could read a whole novel about Marjorie O'Dell and Laurie on the one hand, and a second one about Olive, Teresa, and Isaac. And I think the art history setting might uh, have made me feel even more like it was about real artists. I found myself going online and looking at artwork of that era, trying to figure out if Isaac Robles was a real person or if the painting uh, was based on a real painting. It feels that real to you. And I think this would also be, I just want to add, a slam dunk pick for a book club looking for a title that's a little bit off the beaten path. There's just a lot to discuss there. So Mark, what do you have for us? Well, I'm going to second that because I did like the muse quite a bit. I think Burton is really fantastic. I love the miniaturist, but there's something about the muse that I think I like it better. Um, Do you? Yeah, there's just something about it that, I don't know, it clicked with me really well, too. So, yeah, nice choice. I like it. Yeah. Uh, Well, I went with um, a recommendation for my murder, and it got me thinking about the sort of twisty way that a story can be told, especially a murder mystery. And it made me think of a book that's been out for a bit, but still is living under my skin in kind of unsettling ways. And that's The Shining Girls by Lauren Bukes. Woof. This book is creepy and brutal and it just kind of tosses you around like a rag doll we follow a serial murderer named harper who is using this house that allows him to travel to different points in time in chicago and he is sent to find his victims from the house itself or maybe it's some of his own psychopathic ethos sometimes those lines blur quite a bit but he's able to enter the home, leave the home in a different point in time, and then track down his victims and leave this unsettling calling card that I'm not going to share because it kind of grosses me out. We also follow Kirby, who is this plucky but very messy journalist who is also the only person who has escaped Harper's grasp. Um, And she was almost taken down by him, but was left not unscarred and not unscathed, but at least alive. So she is on a journey to try to hunt him down as well um, in whatever way she possibly can, because she just can't wrap her head around how these things are achieved. The pacing is very shattered and fragmented, and I think the writing just kind of scratches against your skin. I think Lauren Bukes is a writer who is not afraid to get a little dark, get kind of gruesome, but never grotesque. She threads the needle really, really well. And I just think it's very tactful and purposeful writing with this book because it's got a time travel element to it that the reader feels kind of disjointed uh, pretty regularly. And as these killings take place, I just felt rushed, but also paralyzed and sweaty, but also very cold. And it all kind of culminates and folds in on itself as it heads towards the climax in a really interesting and exciting way. I think Bukes is just an impressive writer. And I have read, I think, most of her books at this point. Broken Monsters was also whoa, wild. But this one in particular was the first I read of hers. And it just kind of sent me on a path of like, who 
are you and how does your brain work? I want to know more. The way that she writes her characters is very, it feels very honest, but she's not afraid to just throw them off a cliff in wonderful ways. So check out The Shining Girls by Lauren Bukes. But that is all we have for today. Thank you so much for tuning in to Port Over. Uh, please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. Pretty simple. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. And I'm Jamie. You can follow my home store at BN Leewood KS. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Happy reading. Bye, y'all. Thank you for listening. Port Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.